Welcome to Be Customer Led, where we'll explore how leading experts in customer and employee experience are navigating organizations through their own journey to be customer led and the actions and behaviors employees and businesses exhibit to get there. And now, your host, Bill Stakos. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another week of Be Customer You're Led. I'm your host, Bill Stakos. I have a really cool guest for us this week. Peter Voss is the founder, CEO, and chief scientist for iGo.ai. And we're going to get into what iGo does. This show is being, is, we're dedicating the time to the past, present, and future of conversational AI uh, and its impact on the experience. And I know it is a topic that a lot of you uh, have written me directly to learn more about. And frankly, given Peter's background, uh, and we'll learn a little bit more about his journey as well through this episode, I think that you guys are really going to be engaged and love the show. Peter, thanks so much for joining us today. Really excited to have you on. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, Peter, the first question we always ask each guest is just tell us about your journey. You have an incredible background uh, professionally, uh, incredible journey. Tell us a little bit about your professional journey and maybe some of the big sort of distinctions for you in your career. Well, I, I started out as an electronics engineer and then started my own company doing industrial things, electronic, industrial electronics. But uh, that didn't last very long because I fell in love with software. And my company rapidly turned into a software company. Well, actually a solutions, hardware and software, mm -hmm. but you know, driven, driven by software. So I designed a um, comprehensive ERP system for small to medium-sized businesses, which at the time, they couldn't really afford their own mini computers. So mm -hmm. by providing you know, micro computers or personal computers, I guess they called now networks of those, yeah. and the relevant software, you know, they could have their own in-house computer for inventory control and payroll and, you know, accounting and so on. And so that company was quite successful. We went from literally the garage to 400 people and did an IPO. So that was an amazing experience. I'd love to do that again. I'm sure, yeah. Yeah. So, so that was good, but um, it also gave me the opportunity to sort of stop and think, well, what do I want to do next after that? And the one thing that struck me is how dumb software is, <laughs> you know, and I, and I say that I was very proud of the software we, we created and was better than the competition and, you know, all of that. But still, if the custom, if the programmer didn't think of some scenario, uh, you know, the software would just have an error or do something not very smart. And so... I, I really then embarked on a journey for the last 25 years to figure out how we can bring intelligence to software. How can we make software more intelligent? And I took off five years to study intelligence and related aspects, you know, starting with philosophy, epistemology, theory of knowledge, you know, mm. how do we know anything? What is reality? You know, how do we, how can we be certain of things and, and how does that all work? And, and then also cognitive psychology, mm -hmm. uh, developmental psychology, how do children learn, you know, psychometrics, what, what does IQ measure? Is that meaningful? You know, and how does our intelligence differ from animal intelligence? Mm. Plus, of course, all, I studied all the work that had been done in the field of artificial intelligence. And so a culmination of that was really for me to come up with the design of you know, a kind of a brain, a cognitive architecture mm -hmm. that would, that can, can learn interactively, that can have deeper understanding and, you know, memory and reasoning and all of that. And in 2001, I then launched a commercial, well, initially an R&D company, but I launched a company. Uh, we hired about 10 people and for several years, we basically took these ideas I had and developed them into actual prototypes and eventually a platform and then launched our first commercial company in the IVR space, a company called Smart Action. And, you know, since then, we've basically been, we've continued to develop the technology and crank up the IQ. Excellent. Now you've started um, iGo.ai. 
tell uh, our listeners a little bit about the company and uh, what you and the team are are developing and putting out there. Right. So uh, Ico AI is, is really the second generation of this technology. The company mm-hmm. I mentioned just now, mm-hmm. uh, Smart Action, was in the IVR space with you know voice really focused on voice input. But for various reasons, you know, the in- investors I got in and so on, uh, we got to a point where most of our energy, almost all of our energy was spent in building out the platform and redundancy and reliability, security, mm. and very little effort went into increasing the IQ. So uh, I sold my interest in the company and uh, decided to go back to building a new team to focus on bringing up the tech, you know, cranking up the IQ of the system. So we spent another couple of years, actually about four or five years, just again, focusing on technology Mm -hmm. without a commercial product. And so IGO AI is basically the second generation of this technology. Now, our initial focus is actually on chat rather than voice, you know, Mm -hmm. text rather than voice for a number of reasons. But one of them is that you know, there is a ma- a big shift away from voice to text. Mm-hmm. It's still an open question how this is going to play out, you know, mm-hmm. as speech recognition becomes better and people use it in their cars more, mm-hmm. you know, they may want to go back to voice, but then the younger generation prefers to text while driving. Uh, are we going to have <laughs> autonomous cars that it doesn't matter? Uh, yeah. You know, it, Even it's, wear- it's- wearables like, you know, new glasses or whatever yeah. that wearable might be, et cetera. Yeah. So we, we we don't know yet to what extent you know how this will end up, but but clearly there's a a big shift to to text interactions, mm-hmm. you know, chat. But we actually are in the process of also releasing a voice channel again for for our technology and I got it. Excellent. Tell us a little bit about sort of the evolution of of the technology in this space in particular. I mean, from dumb bots or dumb software, right, mm-hmm. uh, many years ago to I mean, even their advances, I feel like in the last two to three years have been much different than where this space was five years ago, as an example. Yes. Um, uh, how has that, that evolved for you? Yeah. So that there's one way of looking at that that I find quite useful, and, and that is to talk about five levels of chatbots hmm. uh, that some people have used, similar to the five levels of uh, self, self-driving autonomous cars. Mm-hmm. And so the first level or first generation was basically just notifications, you know, that would would be sent out. And then the next generation, the second le- level two chatbots could have some interactions. You know, it was really more like yes or no, or, mm-hmm. or select something. You know, it's like more or less like press one for yeah, yeah. for sales. You know, and and so on. Have that kind of chatbot. And then uh, the level three is pretty much what everybody other than Igo is working on, and that is to try and have some level of interaction with natural language in the flow. And this is where Google dialogue flow, for example, would would play where you can have, you know, some kind of limited natural language interaction, but you know, there's still no deep understanding or learning at sort of keyword, key mm-hmm. phrase triggering. And then you get to um, to level four where you really have uh, memory and learning and understanding where the system remembers what you said earlier in the conversation and can use it. So there's much deeper understanding, you know, long-term memory as Mm -hmm. well, can uh, remember, it can do some reasoning and so on. So it's a much more cognitive type of of interaction. And, you know, but similar to self-driving cars, you still kind of need the human in the loop ultimately. You know, if things go wrong, okay, can I talk to a a human? Okay, we'll talk to a human. Um, whereas level five is, you know, fully autonomous, where mm-hmm. basically the system ultimately can uh, should be able to do in, anything that a human uh, can do in a in a sub, you know particular domain in a s- support role. Also, so that's kind of the evolution, and it's really the technology that we have. We call it a chatbot with a brain, and you really need that brain to be able to operate at level four or five, and you know, all the other chatbots don't have a brain. Now, of course, the next question you say over the last few years, things have changed a lot with deep learning, GPT-3 sure. and, and so on. And I mean, it's amazing what some of that, you know, DALI and, and 
GPT-3, yeah. the kind of conversations, the kind of things they can come up with. It's just absolutely amazing. But it's totally unpredictable what they do. There's no mm. reasoning. There's no learning. They're basically stochastic parrots. So they can have very impressive conversations if you don't really care about their own outcome. If sure. it's just like the journey, you know, it's, it's like fiction. But you try and put this into a, an enterprise to actually do the job of, you know, helping a customer with something, mm -hmm. they call, fall completely flat. Yeah. You really just cannot use them. And how do you hook them up to APIs? They are a black box. You know, how do you extract information? How do you mm. control them? How do they pass legal review? How do they pass, you know, marketing review, uh, customer experience, you know, they can't. I mean, for FAQs, if it's a one shot thing sure. and you're happy that 90% of the time it'll trigger the right FAQ, but that technology has been around for a long time. So oh, it might right, just yeah. be a little, little bit better. Peter, what do you think some of the. I mean, what kind of, if I think of it sort of level four, or even level five for that matter, what are some of the more interesting use cases you're starting to see? Obviously without mentioning names, but uh, what are some of the more interesting use cases you're starting to see for, for that level of sophistication? Yeah. So it's really, I mean, as you have more higher levels of intelligence in, mm -hmm. in that, the system can be a lot more engaging. And so you're moving towards more of a concierge type service or mm -hmm. personal, a personal assistant situation that is personalized to the individual, not a demographic. You know, no, you're not just a number within this bucket, mm -hmm. but you, you're an individual. So the kind of use cases you can start getting into uh, is take, for example, you know, we've all struggled with tech support for, you know, our modems or you know, yeah, sure. Wi-Fi or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Cable television, yeah. Yeah, the motor, yeah, right, the box. Right, exactly. The cable box, yeah. So, you know, imagine you're calling in for support now and, you know, you, the first advice you get will reboot the system, you know. So maybe that takes 10 minutes or something. Yeah. So you might have to hang up or something and, you know, do your thing and reboot the system. So now you call back. But with an intelligent chatbot like iGo, it will remember you, it will remember the conversation, and it won't start off with, please try to reboot your system, which is <laughs> yeah. exactly what yeah. happens have now. You, you know? Have you done this? If yes, press one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. And, you know, and then the next thing might be, okay, maybe your Wi-Fi isn't working, but can you try and move it into the kitchen? You know, mm -hmm. maybe you'll get better reception. So again, you call back now and say, you know, did that work? You know, now that's better than having a human on the other side because the human wouldn't remember that they spoke to you three hours ago or, you know, even half an hour ago, you probably won't even get to the same person. Yeah, You're that's right. Very unlikely to get yeah. to the same person. So you can really have this hyper-personalized concierge type service. And this is true for, you know, whether we're talking about like one of our big customers is 1-800-Flowers mm. and they provide, they're moving more and more into an area where they have this hyper-personalized concierge service utilizing IGO, you know, to that IGO remembers who you buy gifts for. I mean, 1-800-Flowers actually a group of about 10 companies. Mm -hmm. It's a gifting, you know, uh, a company. So, you know, f so for example, you may have bought chocolates for your niece for her birthday. So IGO can remember that it's a birthday, that your niece likes chocolate, what the date is, what mm -hmm. your niece's name mm -hmm. is. And you can actually say to, to, to Igo, hey, can you buy some, can, can you send uh, Nancy some chocolates for her birthday? Sure. You know, we have some new chocolates, maybe, you know, dark chocolate or whatever. Yeah. So you can have that kind of service, uh, hyper-personalized service with, you know, once you have a, a brain and you have memory and you have a deeper understanding. Now, also inside large companies, internal applications, like we, we working with some very large companies that have thousands of employees or tens of thousands mm. of employees and the help desk, the internal help desk uh, for tech support or for HR, you know, again, you can provide that hyper-personalized yep. service, you know, oh, you know, I want to 
take maternity leave in three months. What are my options? You know, let me discuss it with my partner. You know, mm-hmm. next day you come back. Again, the system remembers. Oh yeah, that's the discussion we had, and we can now carry on. Would you like to go ahead and yeah, you know, apply for leave? And do you see? I mean, that piece for me. There's one thing in having the conversation through text or voice, referencing information, et cetera. Um, does, are you focusing on the action as well? So uh, take that maternity leave uh, use case as a, as a great example. Mm-hmm. Is the technology also able to then execute that process and automate that process whereby you may not need someone in HR to do that and they can be maybe focused on more higher, higher order level stuff? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, we do that currently, you know, that we... We go through the, we automate the procedures, basically, you know, whether it's uh, to send a replacement or, Mm -hmm. you know, a credit or a repeat order or so, yeah, all of that can be done. And that's also managed by the brain. So we can actually, you know, once you have a brain that can understand things and react to that, can know basically what to do contextually Mm -hmm. in a given situation, whether that response is to tell the user something or the responses to trigger some API, Mm -hmm. you know, there's not, not a big difference. So the technology is capable of doing that. And yes, we do deeply, we tend to deeply integrate it into the existing uh, infrastructure. Interesting. Are you seeing as much of a push on the B2B side as you are? I mean, we've talked about a couple of B2C, or even if you said from an employee perspective, you can on Mm -hmm. some level argue, okay, that's some level of B2C maybe. Are you seeing also this level of commitment on the B2B side as you are maybe some of more of the retail examples? And are there, uh, are there different use cases? Oh, obviously, there are different use cases. Not, not the right way to ask the question, but what are you seeing there as well? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, yeah, as you kind of pointed out, it depends whether you want to call something B2C. I mean, if you have 10,000 employees internally, is that B2B or Yeah, I, I guess know, it could B2, be B2C. <laughs> so... I think the big distinction I'd like to draw, you know, whether your customers are individuals or other enterprises, you know, we, we clearly deal with both where your customers are I mean, banking examples, you mm-hmm. know, a lot of your customers are other businesses. So it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of a, a, a B2B. But I think the di- bigger distinction I'd like to, uh, to draw here is whether we are s- offering the service to companies or whether we are offering this service to individuals. So mm-hmm. that would be kind of more like a Siri or Alexa type application. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's very hard to get into, into that market, of course. So we, you know, it's something we're planning to do to, mm-hmm. to have individuals own it. And uh, I'm really very excited about that prospect for a number of reasons. And we actually call that uh, application a personal, personal assistant. And it should really be personal, personal, personal assistant, but that's a little bit too much of a mouthful. And let me explain. So there are three different aspects of, uh, three different meanings of the word personal that that really apply. The one is personal in the sense that you own it, it's yours, Mm -hmm. your personal property. So it serves your agenda, not some mega corporation's agenda, Mm -hmm. and you control it unlike any of the so-called personal assistants we have now. So that's the first meaning of personal. Second meaning of personal is hyper-personalized to you, the individual. It knows your preferences, your history, and and so on. Mm -hmm. And the third personal is the one of sort of secrecy or, you know, that you decide what the personal assistant shares with whom. So that security and, you know, we have a number of initiatives where we sort of putting our toe into the water of, of providing these personal, personal assistance. But I think it'd be fantastic once people demand to have a personal, personal assistant, mm. one that they own and control mm. and not some mega corporation. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you can start to think about if it's personal, personal, can it start to be proactive based on the context and where you are mm-hmm. in some journey or or purchase or whatever you want to call that and help you make decisions even through conversation or through text? Fascinating. Right. Peter, when you think about sort of, I mean, the last couple of years have been a little bit crazy for everybody, no matter where you are in the world, but mm-hmm. 
the acceleration of digital due to the pandemic is obviously something that a lot of companies are grappling with. Do you think that, or at least from your perspective, are you seeing consumers who are using this technology? Do you think that there's a pushback? I was recently, and the reason why I ask is I recently came across a statistic whereby 80% of consumers still want to talk to a live person, right? And part of me, and I'm sort of very, I'm the early adopter on the mm. technology diffusion curve kind of thing. But mm. um, part of me is, is it just because of just legacy, I like to do that? Or is there something else going on there where there might be pushback on all the technology that is sort of bestowed upon us now? What is your perspective there? Like, And how might we evolve as consumers and as humans in relation to this technology and how it's going to help us in our lives? Right. So a couple of things related to that. One of them is, you know, it depends how you ask the question. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen other surveys that tell a very different story, you know, that for one, younger people much prefer to just, yeah. you know, interact with, with technology. And uh, so it depends who you ask and how you ask the question. So I don't think it's quite as you know, one side as, yeah, yeah. as yep. you know, as it might seem there. Uh, but then secondly is, let's face it, the majority of chat technology and IVR technology is awful, is absolutely awful. I mean, whenever you call into a company, you know, and your business is important to you, please listen carefully. Our options may recently have yeah. changed. <laughs> and, you know, for quality assurance, we may be... And, you know, I mean, yeah, people just get, get me to, yeah. you know, operate it, you know, zero, rage press zero. zero. Yeah, rage you know, just let zero. me get out of this hell. <laughs> so obviously, yes, if that's the kind of experience you get, you would much rather talk mm. to, to a live person. So the technology that most companies and really big companies are really bad at this. You know, they, it goes through all of their legal reviews and they mm -hmm. have something and then they bring in consultants and so on. And at the end of the day, they spend tens of millions of dollars building a system that's awful. And, you know, there isn't a person who can just say, this thing is awful, change it, fix it. Yep. You know, it, yep. it's not limited by technology as such. It's the, the process, you know, that, and then of course they have the, the sunk cost and, you know, they can't change it and inertia and so on. And, you know, that's true for many of the big companies. And of course, they may have their own internal uh, empire that they've built to develop this IVR or, or chat system, you know, employing 100 people. So who's going to fire them, you know, sure. and, and who's going to make that decision to look, we've got to, we've got to make a radical change here. So, uh, yeah, to answer your question is, you know, the majority of systems are awful. And yeah. so I wouldn't be surprised if people rather want to uh, talk to, to a live person. But what we've also found consistently, and this is not even new, I mean, even going back 15 years when I started Smart Action, mostly people just want to get stuff done. Yeah. You know, sure, there is a small percentage of people that want to talk about the weather and, you know, what happened to them and, and you know, nice fuzzy. But that's a very small minority. Mm -hmm. Most people just want to get stuff done mm. with easy. And if your technology can achieve that, people are very happy to do it. You know, just want to get done. Yeah. So yeah. we need better technology for, you know, a higher percentage of people to say, yeah, I much prefer to deal with technology. Now, the other problem is there is this assumption a human operator is going to be better. And, you know, that's not universally true at all. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and we are, the companies we, we're talking to very universally are telling us they are having incredible problems staffing their call centers, mm -hmm. you know, finding people, turnover, training. Now, what does that mean? It means the quality isn't going to be good. Long that's wait right. times, you know, with automation, zero wait time. Yep. I mean, first of all, you know, how often do you call into your, your bank or insurance company and your current wait time is 45 minutes, you know? Uh, I was just whatever. on there this, I was just doing that this week, actually, and it was not too far off of that mark. And, and, and not only that, but to your yeah. point, your problem will get resolved. 
right? Right. Whereas sometimes if you're talking to a human, hey, I've got to call you back as well, uh, right. which adds a whole other level of complexity yeah. in the experience. Or they have to transfer you and then you yeah. start telling the whole story again, you know, yeah. go through your authentication again and so on. So assuming that the human experience is actually better uh, is not necessarily the right assumption. Again, if you have the right technology, you will get a much, much better experience. No wait time. It remembers you. There isn't the issue of getting transferred to another operator or they have to call you back or mm. any, any of those things. Consistent quality. You know, it's not that, well, what's, are you lucky and getting through to a person who actually knows what they're talking about? Or are you getting through to a person who they just put in the seat and doesn't really care about providing service, you know? So, yeah, I think that yeah. that's uh, important to consider. So some, you know, a lot of our customers starting to realize that with automation, they can actually provide a much better experience. That's right. I mean, even in my role today in the company I work for, we see a lot of that as well. And it's no longer a, um, you know, the top 5% of enterprises talking about mm -hmm. this. You're really seeing it more further down the scale, even well into the right. mid market, which I think mm -hmm. is really, really encouraging too. Peter, can we switch gears for a moment and talk about, you know, where you see this space going? If you think about the advent of new technology as consumers, wearables being one of them, et cetera, and you mentioned at the top of the show, you know, where this may be going, is it voice or text? And, and, mm -hmm. and frankly, I, personally, I think there's probably a space for both, but where do you see the tech going and maybe where's your wish for where it goes to? Well, it's pretty much what, what I mentioned already is, mm -hmm. is, you know, to get to to level five or to make the system smarter and smarter, mm. that it can just be more helpful and to shift the power to the individual. Mm. I mean, that is really my dream and sort of my mission really is to achieve that so that we have this personal, personal assistant that we can trust that can do things for us that can help give us advice, can help us through life, can help mm. us make better decisions to really optimize our lives, you know, in, in, in so many ways. And yeah, that, you know, that you don't even have to deal with those other companies, you know, your personal assistant, your personal, personal assistant will do yeah, that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'll get my people to talk to your people. <laughs> you know? we, we each have a people. Where, yeah. How far do you think we are from that personal, personal um, yeah. assistant? Is that, is that three years? Is that five years out? Like where, when do you think it will be available versus available at scale? Right. So I tend to answer that question that it's, I measure it not so much in time as in money or effort. Okay. And the reason for that is, you know, we've had, there's actually, let me take a little quick detour. There's another way of looking at AI technology that DARPA has presented and they mm -hmm. call it the three waves of AI. And the first wave was, was basically rule-based systems, roughly logic-based systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's what brought us the world chess champion, uh, Deep Blue, yep. and I think the 80s or early 90s. That was the first wave, expert systems and, and so on. Now, the second wave hit like a tsunami about 10 years ago, and that's big data, machine learning, deep learning. And that's the wave we are really currently in. But as I mentioned earlier, it's sort of stochastic parrot. You know, there's nobody at home. It's blind statistical. Now, obviously, there are levels of sophistication and some pretty fancy sure. stuff you can do with that. Uh, speech recognition has mm -hmm. improved significantly mm -hmm. and, and so on. So it, you know, it's obviously incredibly powerful for many, many applications. You know, it helps in uh, image identification, self-driving cars and, and, uh, uh, and so mm -hmm. on. But then there's a third wave of AI, and that is really sort of the cognitive architecture, the cognitive that where there's, there's somebody at home, or at least mm -hmm. you're starting to mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. there's some reasoning, there's interactive learning, there's context, you know, deeper understanding and, and so on. So that's a third wave of AI. Now, because the second wave has been so incredibly successful, it's kind of sucked all of the oxygen out of the air. <laughs> So for the last 10 years, nobody's been working on the third wave because your, your, your quick wins in academia, you want to mm -hmm. get something published, you mm -hmm. know, some incremental progress, mm -hmm. or you even want to do a PhD. What are you going to find a sponsor for? The hot topic, you know, sure. deep learning, machine yeah. learning. Do you want to raise money? Deep learning, machine learning is the only game in town. 
So nobody's really been working on the, the real problem of how do we build a really intelligent system. That's sort of why my answer is the question is not so much in how many years will it take, but how soon do we have people actually working on the third wave of AI? Right. And the problem is right now, all of the people in charge are deep, big data, statistical mm -hmm. experts, you know, mm -hmm. that's the hammer they've got. I mean, look at the big companies, you know, yep. uh, Amazon, Google, yep. and, and, and so on. They have a lot of data. That's a hammer they've got. So everything looks like a nail. So there has to be, you know, and, 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 and there are increasingly you see pu papers published and talk being given of, you know, we're hitting the wall with deep learning, machine mm -hmm. learning, as much as it can do, we're going to need something else. And they talk about hybrid systems and mm -hmm. so on, but it's kind of the wrong people working on the problem because the people that are working on the problem are really, really good at statistical systems, big data systems, and they don't have the background or the, it's not natural for them to think in terms of cognition you know, epistemology, what mm -hmm, I started talking mm -hmm, about, mm -hmm, what is mm -hmm. intelligence, what does it entail, what does it require? So we really need more energy being put into that third wave, into the cognitive architecture approach to solve that. And if, you know, if we have sufficient effort put into that, yes, it could be just a few years away mm -hmm. that we see very significant progress. Now, obviously, our company is trying to do as much as possible, but you yeah. know, at the moment we're only thirty people, so <laughs> we need more like three hundred or three thousand, you know, to oh, yeah. to really rapidly get to human level uh, intelligence. Well, it's a it's a time that I'm really looking forward to personally. I hope I'm still. I'm sure I will be, but I hope I'm still. I'm, I'm around to mm -hmm. to not only see it but also appreciate it as well. That's a fascinating conversation, and, and I appreciate you not putting a date on it on some level, but been talking about it in those three waves and sort of the the level of public and private capital that really needs to get going um, around that third wave to to get us there. Yeah. And it's more the, the right people have to work on it, you know, that um, yeah. the, the right approach, the right background, you know, I mean, you, it doesn't matter how much money you put into something if it's going off the wrong direction, you know, sure. like building ladders to get to the moon, you know. <laughs> Gosh, there, that's a whole other podcast episode, actually. Peter, I started asking guests of mine to ask a question of my next guest, not not because I'm a lazy podcaster. I hope you don't take it that way. Um, what I've found, though, is that because of people's backgrounds, their areas of expertise, some of the questions that I'm getting are really just fascinating, and I do it randomly. And uh, But I'm curious, like, what question should I ask of my next guest? Well, you know, the kind of people you, you interview uh, are interesting people. They, yeah. you know, uh, go getters. And the question I, I would always ask somebody like that is, you know, what would you do if you could wave a magic wand? And I don't mean magic, magic. I just yeah. simply mean, um, you know, if you had enough time and money right now, if, you know, if you could kind of switch careers or mm. gears or right now and you had, you know, enough money to do whatever, what would you do? You know, I mean, some people might say, hey, I would just sit on a beach, you know, in <laughs> Hawaii or, or something. There's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with that either. Yeah. No, fine. You know, but and other people might have, oh, what I'd really like to be doing is X, you know. That's a great question. I'm excited to uh, to ask it. And uh, I'll, I'll shoot you an email with the uh, with the guest uh, and what the response is. Um, great. Thank you. Peter, before we wrap up, um, I know you've got a, a busy day and you're running a company. Uh, where do you turn for inspiration? So at a concrete level, quite frankly, it's programming. I still love programming, even though I've been doing it for decades. Mm. It's to me, it's like, it's like art. It's like a creative process. Mm. Mm. I might've become a rock musician in the early days, you know, if I, if my life had gone a different way, but I find programming to be uh, just very creative and inspirational. You know, you, you're designing something from scratch and you can mm. do pretty much it anything, you know, but at a more philosophical level, it's, it's really the, the, the vision of life becoming increasingly better for us. You know, yeah. humans are still in the early stages of optimizing our lives and how rationality, the right kind of philosophy 
can really help us achieve that optimal living, you know. And of course, you look around at the news and so on, and you know, it doesn't always look that promising. But if you look at the trends of a long time, you know, civilization has become better. And I hope we don't screw it up. Um, <laughs> Me too. And Me too. I, you know, I hope that our personal personal assistant one will start talking sense to people and actually help them make better decisions and not elect idiots, you know, that, yeah. that destroy everything. <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody can put their own label to who they consider that idiot in charge, you sure, know, that yeah. somebody elected um, in the, wherever in the world, you know, yeah. so. I, and when we first connected, you know, some time ago, you know, we talked about, just, you know, we're both very keen and focused on sort of the longevity movement right. and, uh, something that you know over the last i'd say 18 months or so i've really tried to understand better and what what the meaning is of that so i think that is a really i think we as, as a society as a human race are really at the the precipice of some really exciting stuff over the next 20 to 30 years and uh it'll be transformational in so many ways peter this is an incredibly fascinating conversation i sincerely appreciate the gift of your time and and speaking with me and and sharing some knowledge with with our audience uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. Great questions. I enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. All right, everybody. Great conversation this week. Thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next week, everyone. We're out. Talk to you soon, Thanks everyone. for listening to Be Customer-Led with Bill Stakos. We are grateful to our audience for the gift of their time. Be sure to visit us at BeCustomerLed.com for more episodes. Leave us feedback on how we're doing or tell us what you want to hear more about. Until next time, we're out. We're out.